I'm in San Jose, California, Jay Blink with Rush LaSalle. He's director of digital manufacturing. Uh, Rush, we've just done a tour of, of this very impressive tech facility here. But in general, uh, Jable may be the, the biggest, most important company that most people have never heard of. Tell me a bit about Jable. So Jable is a partner uh, to the Fortune 250 manufacturer. So we have a very concentrated base of, of the largest, maybe um, the, the, we like to think, most important brands in the world. And so uh, we've actually uh, grown the business over 50 years uh, from Michigan to being a worldwide global supplier. Uh, we're in 30 countries, uh, over 100 facilities, and about an $18 billion company. Now, $18 billion company, clearly that doesn't come from uh, participating in just one sector. Uh, what sectors of manufacturing do you service or supply? Uh, we're actually very diverse. We run from uh, automotive to consumer electronics to medical uh, into aerospace and uh, defense and military. Now, uh, electric circuits for consumer goods, military, of course, these aer aerospace. Traditionally, uh, people of my generation think about copper clad phenolic PCBs. We think about stuffing boards of discrete components, maybe, you know, uh, uh, double dip IC ICs. But we've gone to a world now where you're doing things with, I understand that in terms of component density and substrates are way beyond anything that we can imagine from the, the old days. Absolutely. I think that one of the things that Jable brings to the market and to our customers is, is really the ability to identify leading technologies, whether it's in the areas of micro machining, whether it's in miniaturization of electronics, uh, whether it's things like 3D printing, things that uh, give our customers advantages in the marketplace around, again, shrinking components so that you can put them into your pocket, as an example, or uh, really the thing especially in a digital era is getting to market faster and those are some of the services and things that we do to help our customers. Now traditional manufacturing of course you know you can have it fast cheap or good you can't have all three of course uh, the traditional uh, knock if you will on 3d printing of course was the process is slow and expensive so fine for prototyping fine for short runs for job shops but for for true mass production it's just not there I understand that you're working to sort of work around that problem. Uh, absolutely. We have a long history of using 3D printing for things like uh, conformal cooling to help in our injection molding processes. Um, certainly in prototyping and ideation to help these brands uh, get their product correct and attractive in the marketplace. Uh, but here in the last two to three years, uh, we've seen some step function changes in both the performance of 3D printing, uh, the way that companies are bringing the products to market, in particular HP and thinking about open ecosystems. Uh, to us, open open ecosystem means uh, they're bringing suppliers uh, in the way of uh, materials and powders uh, to the table that help drive some of the largest cost pooling down. And ultimately the performance of the printers themselves are getting faster, uh, the recyclability of the materials are getting better, uh, all starting to converge where we see economic models that start to intersect what we've seen for short run injection molding. We've historically been the brand behind the brand and that means that we do not want to disrupt what our customers are doing necessarily and how they're servicing the market. If anything, we're we're trying to enable that. And that means, again, getting products to shelf faster, uh, better servicing, the customization of um, the medical industry for, for implants uh, or things of that nature. Um, but you know, the disruption that we think about is in terms of the ecosystem and how suppliers are par partnering together deeper in the supply chain than necessary at the consumer level. Now, it's, uh, we talk about custom mass customization, of course, a buzzword has been talked about a lot. Right. Uh, uh, a lot of industry pros I talk to in manufacturing say, well, you know what, that's overblown, really. We still need volume. We need volume if, if we want to get unit costs down. Or so. uh, what's your opinion on that? Are we, are we ever, ever really going to have that world in which you can have a, um, a lot size of one or two and still get lowest cost? Uh, it's, it, it's really kind of a holy grail. Uh, it's trying to get to the point that you can't produce a single product the same way it would cost to produce a million. Uh, we think there's a lot of big steps between here and there and the near-term ones are just reducing reducing batch size uh, we have an opinion that uh, to help our brands get to market faster we need to distribute manufacturing what that really means to us is that we need to take these large monolithic factories that you find in places like uh, Asia and start deconstructing that and putting it closer to consumption whether that consumption happens to be you or I whether that consumption happens to be final assembly for a uh, automotive supplier um, but those are some of the big steps we see making it to mass customization and so as we think about 3D printing, again, there's an overarching trend in manufacturing that uh, companies don't want to have to produce a million products to get to market because then they can consume the capex that's required. Uh, 3D printing promises that that barrier comes down uh, in step function. 
Now, from the perspective of a manufacturing engineer, is 3D printing, is that a de-risking process? Does it add risk or takes, take risk out? Because we're at a point now where these days, of course, uh, a failure, or if you have to reiterate your product development process, the costs are just prohibitive. Yeah, and it's not a one-size-fits-all just yet. Uh, I think that the one thing, uh, one of the big pros for 3D printing is if you're not cutting steel for injection molding, we, we frequently talk about comparisons to injection molding, so that's our reference point. Um, the reality is, is you can do multiple, multiple uh, iterations um, in the same amount of time it takes to cut steel, and so that's a de-risking element. Um, what's, what's more challenging is that uh, there are phone books of design rules for injection molding that give design designers, engineers, and ultimately procurement comfort in selecting parts that have been injection molding. So um, we're seeing those things start to converge and as we go through the rigors of qualifying the HP printer, the uh, nylon material that runs through it, and then ultimately the parts that come off of it, uh, we're starting to build our own design rules that start to give that level of comfort for 3D printing. Rush, is 3D printing in the end going to take over? Is this going to replace subtractive production techniques? No, I don't believe so. I think that uh, it's, it's going to be the same case as a lot of other technologies that have come into manufacturing uh, it will find its right home and um, there's going to be places we have thousands of injection molding machines I don't anticipate in my lifetime we'll be turning those off. Rush LaSalle very bullish on 3d printing for production processes.